Hey everybody, it's Mike. Monday, January 23rd, 2023. And with this presentation, we're going to talk about the Rolling Stones and not the Beatles. And specifically, we're going to talk about the Rolling Stones recording at Muscle Shoals Recording Studio back in December of 1969 and asked the question, is it smoke and mirrors? In memoirs, it tells us that the Rolling Stones were also a construct of Tavistock. So the Beatles were positioned as the good boys of rock and roll and the Rolling Stones as the bad boys. And so Vicky pointed me to this documentary titled Muscle Shoals, which was released back in 2013, 10 years ago. And they talked to a number of artists and there's a entire segment of the documentary that covers the Rolling Stones recording at Muscle Shoals as part of the tracks they were recording for their Sticky Fingers album. And the two stones that they speak to or that they interview for the documentary is Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. And so we can look at Muscle Shoals as a parallel to what the Wrecking Crew was doing. It's the same exact model. Session players laying down the tracks. And so now that we know what we know about how the music industry works, whenever I listen to or watch any of these documentaries, I watch and listen in a very discerning way. Because once you peel back the veneer, the truth is hidden in plain sight. Now, as I mentioned, not only does the documentary validate what the Wrecking Crew was all about, because as I mentioned, they were doing the same exact thing. It was the same model. But when they got to the Rolling Stones piece of it, that's when I really honed in and listened very closely. And I have a couple of questions. In fact, probably more than a couple. So what I'm going to do is to take you through some background slides. So if you're not familiar with Muscle Shoals, you'll have an idea of what it's about. And then what I'm going to do is play the clip of the Rolling Stones that's in the documentary. And when I do this, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to play the clip. So I'm going to leave it to each of you to take notes and listen very closely to what's being said. Okay, so watch it, pause it, take notes. And then after you get done watching the clip, then I'm going to take you through my notes. And then what we can do is swap notes in the comments section. Okay, so with that, let's move to slide number two and start getting some of the background. Okay, so the documentary starts off with giving us the background and history of Fame Studios. And Fame Studios is located in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, in the United States. Fame, which is an acronym for Florence, Alabama Music Enterprises, is a recording studio located at 603 East Avalon Avenue in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, an area of northern Alabama known as the Shoals. Fame has produced many hit records and was instrumental in what came to be known as the Muscle Shoals Sound. It was started in the 1950s by Rick Hall, known as the founder of Muscle Shoals Music. The studio, owned by Hall until his death in 2018, is still actively operating. The 2013 award-winning documentary Muscle Shoals features Rick Hall, the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section, also called the Swampers, and focuses on the Muscle Shoals sound, which was originally popularized by fame. By the mid-1960s, it had become a hotbed for pop musicians of various stripes, including the Rolling Stones, Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, Clarence Carter, Solomon Burke, and others, according to the Los Angeles Times. The session musicians who worked at the studio became known as the Muscle Shoals Horns and the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section. The rhythm section was also known as the Swampers. In 1969, just after Hall had signed a deal with Capitol Records, the four primary Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section members, 
Barry Beckett, who played keyboards, Jimmy Johnson, who played guitar, Roger Hawkins, who played drums, and David Hood, who was the bassist, left to found a competing business, the Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. So let's move to slide number three and learn a little bit more about this competing studio, which is the one that recorded the Rolling Stones. Okay, so Muscle Shoals Sound Studio, founded by Barry Beckett, Roger Hawkins, Jimmy Johnson, and David Hood. These were the session players that were playing for Rick Hall at Fame Studios, and they left and founded their own recording studio. Muscle Shoals Sound Studio is an American recording studio in Sheffield, Alabama, formed in 1969 by four session musicians known as the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section. The Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section partnered with Jerry Wexler, who provided startup funding. Now, Jerry Wexler was a big-time producer, and he was very dominant in the music industry from the 1950s through the 1980s. Beckett, Hawkins, Johnson, and Hood left nearby Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals to create their own recording facility. The four founders of the studio, Beckett, Hawkins, Johnson, and Hood, were session musicians at Rick Hall's Fame Studios. They were officially known as the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section, but widely referred to as the Swampers, who were recognized as having crafted the Muscle Shoals sound in conjunction with Hall. They attracted noted artists from across the United States and Great Britain. Over the years, artists who recorded at Muscle Shoals Sound Studio included the Rolling Stones, Aretha Franklin, Dwayne Allman, George Michael, Wilson Pickett, Willie Nelson, Leonard Skinner, Joe Cocker, Levon Helm, Paul Simon, Bob Seeger, Rod Stewart, Tomiko Jones, Cher, and Cat Stevens. The Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section was the first group of musicians to own a studio and to eventually run their own publishing and production companies. They provided musical backing and arrangements for many recordings, including major hits by Wilson Pickett, Aretha Franklin, and the Staple Singers. A wide range of artists in popular music also recorded hit songs and complete albums at the studio. The Swampers had first worked together in 1967 and initially played sessions in New York and Nashville before doing so at Fame. Their initial successes in soul and R&B led to more mainstream rock and pop performers who began coming to record at Muscle Shoals Sound Studios, including the Rolling Stones, Dwayne Allman, Traffic, Bob Seger, Elton John, Boz Skaggs, Willie Nelson, Paul Simon, Bob Dylan, Dr. Hook, Elkie Brooks, Millie Jackson, Julian Lennon, and Glenn Fry. So you can see their clientele was pretty much an A-list of artists and performers. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and let me show you what these guys looked like back in the day. Okay, so here are the Swampers, and I'll bet for most people they don't look anything like you thought they were going to look. It's 1969, we're thinking long hair, beards, mustaches, 1969 rock and roll attire, but no, this is what they look like, and these guys were an awesome talent, and the folks that were behind the tracks that you're hearing on so many of these songs, just like with the Wrecking Crew. So we have Barry Beckert, who played keyboards, Roger Hawkins, drums, David Hood, who I think is the only one that's still alive, played bass, and Jimmy Johnson played guitars. And I would be remiss if I didn't call out that lyric in Leonard Skinner's song, Sweet Home Alabama, that says, now Muscle Shoals has got the Swampers, and they've been known to pick a song or two. Okay, so these four guys were the foundation behind so many songs that were coming out of Alabama. And so with that, let's now talk about the Rolling Stones showing up at Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. Okay, so from Wikipedia, the Rolling Stones were at Muscle Shoals Sound Studio from December 2nd through December 4th of 1969. So three days tops. And they were there to record tracks for their Sticky Fingers album. Now, they didn't record all of their tracks there. They recorded You Gotta Move, Brown Sugar and Wild Horses at the studio. 
Sticky Fingers is the ninth British and 11th American studio album by the English rock band The Rolling Stones. Now, let's note the 9 and the 11. So, Sticky Fingers is encoded with 911. The Stones released it on the 23rd of April 1971 on their new and own label, Rolling Stones Records, and I believe that's the tie into Jerry Wexler. And if we look at the numerology of the date, the 23rd of April, 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 9. 1971 reduces to 99, so we have the triple nines, and if we flip the nines, we have 666. They had been contracted by Decca Records and London Records in the UK and the US since 1963. On this album, Mick Taylor made his second full-length appearance on a Rolling Stones album after the live album Get Your Ya Ya's Out. It was the first studio album without Brian Jones, who died two years earlier. The original cover art was conceived by Andy Warhol and photographed and designed by members of his art collective. Most of the songs featured drums, guitar, bass, and percussion as provided by the key members of the band, meaning the Rolling Stones. Additional contributors were made by longtime Stones collaborators, including saxophonist Bobby Keys and keyboardist Billy Preston, Jack Nitsche, Ian Stewart, and Nicky Hopkins. As with other albums of the Rolling Stones late 1960s, early 1970s period, it was produced by Jimmy Miller. You'll notice that I bolted out the names of the collaborators working with the Stones on the Sticky Fingers album, and where you see one asterisk, that denotes a session musician. So Bobby Keys, Billy Preston, Jack Nitsche, and Nicky Hopkins. Ian Stewart has two asterisks because there's an interesting story behind him. Ian Stewart was actually in the Stones lineup until May of 1963 when he was removed. In Wikipedia, they say that he was actually a co-founder of the band. He stayed on as their roadie and a keyboard player. So I guess we can consider Ian a session player himself. But I put the double asterisk because there's an interesting story behind his part with the band. And so with that, I'm going to play the clip from the documentary. And as I mentioned earlier, what I would like you to do, knowing what you know now about the music industry, is to sit back and take notes. Be very discerning with what it is that they are presenting. And then after the clip ends, I'll take you through my notes. And then we can compare notes in the comments section. Okay? So without further ado, here's that clip. Six months went by, seven months, almost eight months. I think we would have killed for the hit record. We always wanted to own a studio and it was like, what the hell have we done? And then all of a sudden, the English rock and roll guy started wanting to come to Muscle Shows. When we went to record in Muscle Shows, it was a really lightning visit. You know, we just went in there, set up and, you know, played our stuff for a couple of days. The sound was in my head before I even got there. And then, of course, when that actually lives up to it and beyond, you know, then, you know, you're in rock and roll heaven, man. <laughs> you got to move. You got to move. You got to move, Jack. You got to move. Oh, when the love. The first tune we did was a uh, blues tune, and you got to move. We're down in Alabama, we're down in Muscle Shows. We've got to cut some Fred McDowell stuff. If I'm ever I'm going to do it, it's got to be here, you know. And we're probably soaking up the little Indian maiden too, you know. <laughs> We don't come from here, but we know quite a bit about the Deep South, <laughs> from here. <laughs> Their producer did not show, and it wound up I became the engineer. And I was thinking, oh man, can you believe this, you know? Because like, when they're coming out, you'll stop, boom, boom. Yeah, but that's there. It doesn't come until the solo. No, I know, I know. But I must point something out here, that nobody was drinking and nobody was drugging. Well... <laughs> you got the <demons. laughs> <laughs>
I think we were drinking quite a lot. I'm sure there were lots of drinking and smoking marijuana and so on. Well, you know, I mean, it depends on the scale of what, you know, but... Uh... That was recording in those days. That was part of it. But otherwise, it was a lot of serious work as well. And once we knew the room was, was tuned to us and we were tuned to the room, then it became, you know, right, let's get as much down to here as we possibly can, you know. Keith had this tune, Wild Horses, but I don't think that was really finished. He had a chorus, but that was about it. So that was all written on the spot. It was just an idea, and it had to go to the bathroom for a little while, <laughs> just to sort of figure it out. And then say, OK, I'm ready, back in, and then uh, take, you know. Marshall shows studio was in this rather interesting place. Being there does inspire you to do it slightly differently. Wild Horses is a sort of country song. And I remember we used Jim Dickinson, he played tack piano. I thought it was one of the easiest and rockinest sessions that we, we'd ever done. I don't think we've been quite so prolific ever. <laughs> I mean, we cut three, four tracks in two days, and uh, that for the Stones is going something. You know. We left on a high with Brown Sugar, man. You know. I mean, we knew we had you know, one of the best things we'd ever done. The thing about Brown Sugar had this sound, it was quite distorted. It was pretty funky, you know, that was the whole idea of it. You know, I always wanted to go back there and cut more, you know. Then shit happened, so we ended up in France in a basement doing Exile on Main Street there, but otherwise Exile would have probably been cut in muscle shows. And that politically it wasn't possible, it wasn't allowed in the country at the time, so <laughs> that was that, you know. Those sessions were as vital to me as, uh, as any I ever done. I mean, all this other stuff, the Beggar's Banquet and, uh, and the other stuff we did. Gimme Shoulder, it was a street fighter man, and Jumping Jack Flash, you know. But, but uh, I've always wondered that if we'd have cut them in muscle shoals, if they might not have been a little bit fun deal. <laughs> okay, so I have three slides. Two are my notes, and the third is a summary of my thoughts. So in the clip, we're told that the studio is struggling and it needs a hit record. And then, quote, all of a sudden, the English bands wanted to come to Muscle Shoals in Alabama. Jagger tells us that it was a lightning visit. They set up and played their stuff for a couple of days. Keith Richards says the sound was in my head before I even got there. And then we're told that the Stones producer, Jimmy Miller, did not show. I thought that was odd. And Jimmy Johnson, who is the Swampers guitarist and founder of the studio, takes on the role of being the engineer for the session. Jimmy Johnson also tells us that nobody was drinking and nobody was drugging. However, Mick Jagger contradicts that statement and says we were drinking quite a lot and smoking, smoking weed, and then goes on to say that that was recording in those days, drinking, smoking, and drugs. 
Keith Richards then says that the room was, quote, tuned to us and we were tuned to the room. Jagger then says that Keith had wild horses, but it was not finished. He said that Keith had the chorus and it was, quote, all written on the spot. Where have we heard that before? And then they cut back to Keith and he tells us that Wild Horses was an idea. And to finish the song, he went to the bathroom for a while to figure it out. So that's where he wrote Wild Horses, in the men's room at Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but <laughs> I don't quite believe that story. Let me go to slide seven and page two of my notes. Jagger then says that the studio inspires you to do it, meaning write and record differently. And he also tells us that Jim Dickinson, who was a session player, played tack piano on Wild Horses. And then Keith tells us that it was one of the easiest and rockingest sessions we've ever done. And then Keith says something that I think is very telling. He said, I don't think we were ever quite so prolific ever. We cut three to four tracks in two days. And then he said, we left on a high with brown sugar. We knew it was one of the best things we've ever done. And then said, I always wanted to go back there, meaning back to Muscle Shoals studio, to do more. I always wondered that if we had cut all the recordings at Muscle Shoals, if they, meaning the other recordings, might not have been a little bit funkier. And my last note, not once were the Rolling Stones ever shown in the studio writing or recording the songs. We only get the words and the imagery. And where have we seen that before? And so with that, let me move to slide eight and tie it together. Okay, so it's the next day. It's Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. I got caught up with errands and the such, and so I couldn't complete the video yesterday. But in any case, this is my wrap-up slide. This is where I'm trying to bring together my notes. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, hopefully you guys and gals took notes as well, and then we can compare our notes in the comment section. So, as I mentioned in the previous chart, not once during the documentary were the Rolling Stones ever shown in the studio writing or recording the songs. What we got were words and window dressing. And what I mean by window dressing is we have scenes of the Stones arriving and leaving and spending time in the engineer's booth, but we don't get any footage of them writing songs or laying down the recorded track. So there's no evidence that the Stones were writing and recording at the studio. And to make the story work, the viewer or the audience must assume that the Stones were in the studio writing and recording, meaning that the audience fills in the blanks. So this is what's done with official narratives. They lead you to a conclusion. But as they do this, there's real no hard evidence or proof. You just have to believe the story. So if somebody asks, well, where's the evidence and where's the proof? They say, well, I just told you what they did. Well, telling me something is not evidence or proof. And this goes on all the time. And then we have the comment from Jagger saying that it was a lightning trip to Muscle Shoals. It was three days. They arrived on December 2nd and they wrapped up on December 4th of 1969. And my take on it is to write and or record three songs. One of the songs, at least from scratch, or pretty much from scratch, that would be Wild Horses. It doesn't seem feasible to me. We're also not told how much time they spent in the studio each day. Was it eight-hour days, 10-hour days, 12-hour days, 
four hours, we're not told. And then we have Keith Richards commenting that they were never so prolific as they were at Muscle Shoals. By him saying that, what that was telling me is that what they allegedly did at Muscle Shoals with those three songs was not the norm for the Rolling Stones. In other words, they pulled a rabbit out of the hat. And then we have the on-demand writing phenomenon. We see this all the time. We've seen it with the Beatles. We hear about it here in this documentary with the Rolling Stones. In fact, if you watch just about any rock documentary, you're going to get some semblance of that narrative. So as an example, we're told that Wild Horses had just a chorus, and that was from Mick Jagger. Keith Richards said it was just an idea. But then we get this very bizarre story from Keith, and he says that to finish Wild Horses so that they can record it at Muscle Shoals, he went to the bathroom. And that's where he worked on the song. And then Shazam! He left the bathroom and he handed the song over to the rest of the band and Jimmy Johnson and said, We're done. I'm sorry, but. That story is ridiculous. It didn't happen that way. The songs could have been partially recorded before sending the tapes to Muscle Shoals for specific overdubs. For example, perhaps at Muscle Shoals, guitars needed to be added. Piano. We know that Mick Jagger told us on Wild Horses, Jim Dickinson, who was a studio player, did the piano work on that song. They could have been there to do the vocals, etc. I think the songs were already written and mostly recorded with the exception of overdubs. Again, keyboards, guitar work, and so on. And it's very possible that at Muscle Shoals, that's where Jagger could have put down the vocal tracks. But I do not buy the story that the three songs that were told that came out of Muscle Shoals were written, rehearsed, arranged, and recorded within that three-day period of time, December 2nd through December 4th of 1969. There had to be at least partial work coming into Muscle Shoals to get those songs done within a three-day period of time. That's my take. And then we're told that the Stones producer, Jimmy Miller, he doesn't show. He's missing in action. And I'm thinking, well, that's probably because he didn't have to. He was well aware of the competency and the reputation of the studio talent and Jimmy Miller knew that what he was going to get back from Muscle Shoals was going to be top shelf, and then he would pick up the producing from there. Keith Richards' comment that the sound was in his head and the studio was, quote, tuned to us, well, I think that's because they knew what sound to expect from the Muscle Shoals studio. Or it could also be storytelling, embellishing to buff up the narrative. Then we have the, the conflict that had to do with whether they were drinking and doing drugs. Jimmy Johnson tells us that there was no drinking and drugging while they were working in the studio, while Jagger and Richards tell us that they did drink and smoke weed. So why the conflict? How is it that we have two different versions of the story when the two parties were both there at the same time? Well. Either the Stones embellished a story for rock star image purposes, or it's because Jimmy Johnson's studio personnel were not under the influence while working on the songs, because they were at work. And when they worked, they didn't indulge. And drinking and drugs, seldom if ever, contribute to being prolific or efficient especially when you have a three-day studio gig. You've got to get in and get out, which means you have to be of clear mind. The mythos around 
rock and roll being all about alcohol, sex, and drugs is nothing more than a social engineering narrative. That's all it is. In fact, if you watch a lot of these rock documentaries that are out there, what happens is the artist or the musician, the performer, if they fall into substance abuse, drinking and drugs and so on, what they inevitably tell you during that documentary is if they stay on that path, it's the kiss of death. Many of these artists will say that they had to get themselves out of that ditch. They had to stop drinking. They had to stop doing drugs because if they didn't, they knew that it was all over. And many will say that when they did that, when they got themselves cleaned up, that's when everything in their life got better, including the music the creativity, the innovation. You can't do basically anything that's worth doing if you're doing it while you're inebriated or you're under the influence. It's not just music. It's anything. So it's important to remember that what the controllers did, what Tavistock did, was to tie this alcohol, sex, and drugs mythology around rock and roll and it was social engineering in order to acclimate the masses to getting into alcohol, sex, and drugs. Then we have Keith Richards stating that they were never so prolific and I mentioned this before. And Keith wonders what other recordings would have sounded like if they were recorded at Muscle Shoals. And in my opinion, this is an unintentional clue that Keith Richards puts out there. He's talking about the quote, the feel of a song. That's really what he's talking about. But the feel of a song emanates from the musicians that are playing on the recording and the producer. It doesn't come from a building or a town, especially when you're there for two or three days. The reason other songs did not have the Muscle Shoals sound is because the other recordings did not have the Muscle Shoals lineup behind the recorded tracks. In other words, these other songs that Keith Richards was talking about didn't have the Muscle Shoals production. All songwriters and musicians have influences, and those influences shape our output. So when you're working on a song and you're recording a song, because those influences are hardwired into your thought process, a certain sound is generated. And that sound is reflecting the influences that have shaped your world as a songwriter and a musician. If you change up the personnel, in other words, you're using different band members, you have switched to a different producer, now what's happened is you have changed up the mix. And by changing up the mix, you're going to get a different sound or a different feel to the music. If the Rolling Stones were writing all of their own music, and playing on all of the recorded tracks, then what you would see is consistency across all of the songs and the albums as far as the sound goes. Now, some folks might say, well, there is a consistency. There is a Stones sound. And I would argue, yes, if we are looking at certain periods of time, because the Stones did change up their sound over time. But addressing specifically what Keith Richards said, Keith said that songs after the Muscle Shoals sessions, after Sticky Fingers, didn't have that same feel. And the reason for that is because it wasn't the same mix of musicians and production that went into those songs. And Keith knows this. But whether his comment was made intentionally or unintentionally, 
it is a clue as to what is going on. I do have to say that the Stones are more open about working with studio players, something that the Beatles didn't touch. The only time we actually knew about studio players was when Billy Preston showed up for the Get Back sessions. And even then, he wasn't even referred to as a studio musician. He was a friend that came and and then we were getting stories about Billy Preston being the fifth Beatle because he played on the Let It Be album and so on. So the Beatles were very protective of trying to keep the, the Beatles as a unit, as these four brilliant genius songwriters and musicians, whereas the Rolling Stones were more open to divulging that they did have a supporting cast of characters. Okay, so I'm going to give them credit for that. So to wrap up my observations and my note-taking from watching the documentary and specifically this segment about the Rolling Stones, I put them into the same category as the Beatles. They did not write all of their own music and they weren't on all of the recorded tracks either. And I'm going to have to agree with what Memoirs tells us. Knowing what I know about the music and entertainment industry, the Rolling Stones were another engineered and manufactured band. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the Beatles were propped up as the good boys of rock and roll and the Stones were the bad boys. And they played the role really, really well. Okay, so with that, let me finish up with my last slide. So I now have three documentaries that I highly recommend if you want to learn how the music industry really works. You know, I've talked about The Wrecking Crew, Hired Gun, and I've added Muscle Shoals to that list of recommended viewing. Muscle Shoals and The Wrecking Crew are really linked tightly together because it's the same story, except this one took place on the West Coast and the East Coast of the United States and Muscle Shoals was doing the same exact thing in the South. So again, if you really want to understand how it works, how the music gets generated, then watch these three documentaries. And so with that, I'll wrap up. The comment section is open. You guys and gals have a great day and we will talk soon.